YouTube, what's up with it? It's Envy Claws a Med Grower, your homie, Mr. Big Dookie, and we're back for yet another weekly update. See everything's going along well. Leroy's doing his thing. Flowers obviously coming along wonderfully. So, no further ado. Let's get right into it. See, we got some changes. I've been pretty busy lately. So, we'll definitely be talking about what's going on in there in this episode. You can see all the small ones are starting to get a little bit of growth to them and some transplants. The big one back there is, well, a big old freaking autoflower. And. Big Dookie's getting comfy, so that means it's time to talk about flower. Alright. Lots and lots of nice things coming across here. And uh, we'll start out with the oldest first. Medusa by Nirvana Seeds is on day 35. Day 35. There we go. Let's see the light balance adjusts there. Got plenty of frost. Definitely a really, really beautiful plant. Didn't stretch nearly as much as I want it to. And it got a little bit burned in flower. You can see all the burn tips on it just slightly. See like, uh, see those little curl ends on the leaves. Those are from a nutrient burn going a little too hard on it. You definitely wanted a little bit lighter nutrients and uh, for whatever reason didn't stretch much. Kind of awkward traits for a sativa. But it is flowering out really nicely. I mean for day 35 it's got decent bud production. They're not huge but they have nice shape to them. I'm expecting them to dense up well and give me some really good quality bud for sure. Because it really does have some uh, nice frost on it. Let me see if I can get some new close-ups. There you go. So yeah, I'm expecting a pretty decent end product here. Gonna bring it out at least another month, at least nine weeks. I was planning on going ten weeks with it since it's a, you know, sativa dominant hybrid with really sativa dominant leaf structure. I was expecting it to be a little more, you know, longer running, but we'll see where it's at. It's definitely already starting to shape up and bulk up like it's like it's doing something more like a nine weeker as compared to a longer running sativa. So could be fun though if I get a really quick flowering, uh, you know, sativa dominant hybrid. Those those can always be some really good phenotypes to have, so you can still get that energetic euphoric high from the sativa with uh, you know a little bit quicker flower. So it might be a really useful trait to have in that, even if that's not the perfect plant in the world, it might have, you know, some definitely really positive genes that might be useful inside it. So, you know, cool plant anyway. So that's uh, Medusa by Nirvana Seeds. Rambled about that one a little, a little long. What do we get into next? How about the next oldest? Are these two right here? These are the Purple Fires, and they're on day 24. See, they're coming along well. This one's a little more bushy, a little more hybrid leaf structure. This one's, uh, you know, also hybrid leaf structure, but a little more sativa dominant. This one's like a 50-50 structure, even maybe even a little more indica dominant. Definitely two different phenotypes. And uh, they're both coming across really well with the frost. I'm not really impressed with the bud size that much. I mean, it's making little buds, but for day 25, I'd expect them to be at least a little bit bigger. And same thing with this pheno, so it might just be the strain itself is not the largest bud growing, or maybe it just grows its size late. Some strains do that, so we'll see. But, you know, for day 25, it's definitely got uh, some okay stacking. And this particular pheno right here is my favorite because the frost on it is thick. Look at this for day 25. Just all the way out on the fan leaves. Or on the sugar leaves, sorry. It's 
some really, really thick frost in there. Some decent stacking, but it, it's just doesn't have any size to it. So that's purple fire, and this was bag seed I got from my brother-in-law up in the Bay Area. So we're just trying it out. Didn't actually cut any clones either one of these plants. I'm just plan on running them once originally for a little bit of test to see if they have hermaphrodite. And so far I haven't seen any early flower hermaphrodites, which is really, really nice. Not even like, notice down here I need to clean this up. Sometimes if you have a really strong hermaphroditic plant, when you lollipop it and this new growth starts coming in, it'll come in with nuts on it because it was so stressed. And I'm not even seeing any of that on any of this. That's all just regular growth. So. I think we're doing pretty well here as far as uh, avoiding the hermaphroditics. Bull crap. So, purple fire, day 25. Gonna let that fill out and probably go about nine weeks too. We'll see. We'll see. It definitely, it almost looks like it's running slower than what that Medusa has been. So, I don't know, we'll find out. And this one over here, Toxic Lore. This one's coming along pretty well. It's day 16. And you can see the stacking on this and the bud size on this plant is almost the same size as those purple fires that are on day 24. So this is eight days behind the plant next to it. And like, look at But on the left is Toxic Lord, but on the right is the purple fire. Like, there's barely a size difference there. And, uh, like I said, this is a week before. This one has more frost showing right now. But this one's by uh, North Genetics, and this one's off their newer lineup, too. This is Godbud crossed with Chemdog. And I haven't run this yet, so this is, you know, unproven phenotype. Just popped two seeds of it. One seed ended up male, I believe. And this is what I got for the other. So you can definitely see where the frost is starting to come in on it, which is nice. Day 16, you can see the little baby specks when I zoom right in there. That means by the three week mark, I'll definitely have some nice frost on it, proving that it's probably going to be a fairly potent strain. Usually if you're getting frost early like that, you usually end up with a, a better product in the end product. Not always, but usually. You know, pretty good rule of thumb. And uh, this one's coming along right on par. Uh, this one came along really well with the frost, size so-so. This one's decent frost, size so-so. Size is a hair better than this one, though. That one, well, we've talked enough about that awkwardness. So, look at that stacking, though. Toxic Lord stacking is dope. Our genetics knocking it out of the park with these ones. Godbud, Chemdog. Stabilized into that beautifulness. So, Let's move it on to the last one we got here, and this is a purple chemo G. This is a chemo G crossed with Brandon Purple. And my particular pheno of it is really lanky, really stretchy, as you can see. Like even the fan leaves usually stretch out and have quite a long stalk off of the fan leaves as they grow bigger. Like you'll see some of them, like look at this one right here. Starts way down there and this fan leaf is just where is it? That leaf right there. It's crazy. They just stick out all over the damn place. And uh, it also kind of grows really stretchy, lanky buds. But it grows so freaking frosty and dank. I can't wait till you guys get to see this thing flowering when I get back from vacation. So, yeah, it's uh, day eight of flower right now. So you see it's just starting to get its fill in. It's got like another 10 or so days of stretch left, so some of these taller ones I might uh, like kind of super crop them down a little bit or break them down because they're already getting to where they're, you know, maybe two inches, inch and a half from that upper net. And once they pass that upper net, it's not long until they get up too close to that double-ended HPS. Like, really got about two inches on this corner until it gets too close and, you know, can get a little higher once it gets further in the back but yeah it gets pretty intense once it gets uh more than two inches above that net so 
it's my goal anyways to keep it a little bit below that. You see most of these these ones down here I've been retucking so they're not quite as tall. I'm probably going to retuck this one one more just because it's right under the uh, light. And I've noticed the last few times that I've ran this these buds end up getting fried. Those buds grow really well. So maybe if I can keep that a little lower and kind of space it upright, get a little stadium effect around my lighting, I think it'll grow really well. But yeah, overall, it's uh, flipping into flower mode, changing its hormones really well, growing pretty fantastic. And that's my purple chemo G. So you can see this one will start getting frost on the fan leaves. Some of the upper fan leaves, they'll separate way away from the buds and just frost everywhere. Like honestly, you can see, uh, I believe both my how to extract hash video and my how to ex or for bubble hash and for ISO hash oil. Both those videos I use Purple Chemo G trim and my yields are just great. I mean, there's no way around it. It's an amazing hash plant, at least this Fino I have. So, it's pretty cool. That's flower. We got a lot more to talk about. So, let's change the white balance and get over there into veg. All right. Now we're over here into veg and in fact, before we talk about veg, let's, uh, let's talk about NAC control. Uh, one problem, in fact, one viewer mentioned it on my last weekly update, that uh, they noticed a little fungus gnat. And, you know, I really don't like the guys. Fungus gnats suck. But they aren't a huge problem either, but I at least wanted to talk a little bit about fungus gnat prevention and fungus gnat destruction if you do have a problem with them. So as of right now, I do have a minor infestation. It's very minor and it's honestly not a problem to me as a home grower growing very small, you know, small plants, just a few tents here and there. It's uh, fungus gnats don't do a whole lot of damage. All right, fungus gnats to start it off, they have three life cycle, parts of their life cycle. They have an egg, then they have a larvae stage, and then they have the fly stage. As an egg, what you can do, well, you can kill them off as eggs, but they don't really do any damage to your plant. As larvae, they actually do the most damage to your plant out of their life cycle. As larvae, they will chew on the smallest little bits of roots that are growing off of your roots, little shoots that are feeder shoots that are uptaking all your nutrients. They'll feed off of those and slightly damage them. But the thing is, these larvae are so insanely small and your root system is so incredibly big to them, it takes hundreds of thousands of them before it really notices enough damage to really start damaging your plant and your plant to really start having major issues because of it you know so uh larva stage is definitely something you got to watch out for and then the fly stage they usually do almost no damage at all to your plant sometimes if you have a major infestation and you're having hundreds of flies around they might lack places to get water and in that situation they might try to pull water from your leaves and actually eat at your leaves but that's very very rare that's not normal for fungus uh, gnats and it takes a really really large population of them to do that so like I said fungus gnats out of all pest problems they're the most minor and in the amount of infestation I had I probably could have left it being still grown perfectly fine buds perfectly safe very low amount of pests and you know insect matter like even if I got them tested for insect matter I'm sure my buds would be just fine it's you know very 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 small amount but we can see I think I yeah I did catch a couple on this trap down here hopefully we can zoom in so you can kind of see what they look like see that guy stuck to it got a little fly little fly body and little wings on them you know, it's kind of two of them right there. But they, uh, yeah, little jerks that don't do a whole lot but annoy the hell out of your life. So instead of annoying your life, looking disgusting, and very, very, very minorly harming your plants, we can do things to get rid of them. So there's a three-pronged approach to getting rid of them that attacks each one of their life stages. So we'll start off with the eggs. The eggs you can actually kill off with hydrogen peroxide. And I'll use this that you actually find from the store. Mine's empty, so I need to throw this away. But you see this is just like the pharmacy grade 3% that you use to, uh, you know, clear bacteria from cuts or anything like that. But the hydrogen peroxide, as uh, 
What it is is H2O2, a lot of people are wondering, molecularly, so it's only one extra oxygen molecule or atom added onto a water molecule. And what happens is when that comes in contact with biological matter, I just threw that away, but when it comes in contact with biological matter, it will release the other oxygen, making it a free radical oxygen that then to really small bacteria and really weak things like that, it actually kills it off. So that's how it actually works. And on those eggs are so weak that the uh, a dose enough of hydrogen peroxide will actually kill them. But it's very important when you add your hydrogen peroxide that you only add it to a full medium. So like, uh, say for instance, this plant right here, when I added the hydrogen peroxide, I made sure I watered the plant completely first. This plant's on flush, so I actually just watered it with plain water, but if you were on a nutrient plant, you would flood it with your nutrients. The only thing you don't need to add on this one is anything involving beneficial ends or beneficial bacteria or mycorrhizae. Completely keep that out of whatever feeding this is, because what we're trying to do is soak the pot so that way when we put the hydrogen peroxide on the surface it doesn't soak all the way through the pot because we don't want to kill all our beneficials and all our mycorrhizae throughout our whole root zone we only want to kill the eggs that are in the top inch or so of the soil they only stay in the top inch because the flies can't dig down through the soil so the eggs are all in the top and you make sure your soil is completely wet and then you spray over the top just a thin layer over the top of that hydrogen peroxide three percent and that'll kill a large population of the eggs that are in your soil so that way they don't breed up and you don't have as many issues. So that's for the eggs. For the larvae, all right, there's a couple different products you can use. This is the one I chose to get. It's a little more expensive than some of the other options, but uh, it's definitely one of the most effective. And this is actually a broke up fiberglass substance that you can see I have on the top of all my soil substrate. and. Uh, what it does is it has incredibly fine little pieces let's see how fine we can get down in there that we probably can't even see all the way zoomed in that will actually cut up the larva's body so as they try to crawl past this stuff and in those little holes and in throughout it it'll actually cut up the larvae and slice up their soft little body and kill them so they can't get up through it now, also on this gnat mix, they say that you should put it a half inch to three quarter inch thick over the entire top layer, and that's so that way the flies can't be land back on it and lay more eggs to keep it perpetuating. But realistically, as long as you have about a quarter inch, it's gonna kill 90%, nine, well, probably 99% of the larvae that are in there as they're crawling around. And make sure after you put this stuff on, Give it a good feeding so that way the larvae come to the top because they'll float in water if you have a bad infestation ever. It's kind of fun. You can uh, soak one of your pots with water so that way the water's sitting up to the top. Look with a microscope down on the water and you'll see all sorts of little wiggly larvae. It'll piss you off. But uh, yeah, it's nasty. But either case, do that so they come up to the top and then they're forced to swim back down through all this shit and uh, fucks them up. So, sorry about the language, but you know, pests pests make you angry so that's uh what we do for them there are some other alternatives like you can use playground sand and actually put it in like a quarter to a half inch thick layer and then it's so thick and heavy that the larvae cannot turn into a fly and fly back up out of the soil and the flies cannot get down through it to lay eggs into the moist soil so you can use playground sand but if you're using hard pots like this i would advise against it because it then restricts your plant from allowing any air to get down into your medium. If you're using smart pots, playground sand's perfect way to go and it's only like three bucks a bag. As compared to this, that's like 10 to 15 bucks a bag. So I think I paid like 15 at the grocery store. So something like that. Um, yeah, but it, you know, I was able to put a thin layer on everything, still got half a bag left. I can't complain, I guess. So yeah, there's that, and then the only other thing that I know of that will work other than chemicals, I'm trying to keep chemicals out of this, like pesticides, any of that crap. Yes, they work, but you don't really want to soak your root zone with pesticides, and that's where these guys lay. They're not up in your, up in your leaves, you know, fungus gnats stay down in your soil. So 
the only other thing I believe is diatinaceous earth. And if I remember right, I'm not 100%, that's like fossilized seashells and crust up, crushed up fossilized she seashells in incredibly small amounts. And works very similar to this fiberglass type stuff to where it'll cut up the larvae and kill them as it's going. So, one last thing to talk about, and that's the flies. Fly strips. I mean, I uh, should have got some of the flat ones. They actually work a lot better because you need them down near your soil. But I happened to be in Lowe's when I remembered to grab some. This is all they had, and you know, it'll work. But instead of hanging these things up like you would do for flies, keep them down near the soil. Like you can see how I got this one down uh, sitting along the soil edge there. So that way, any fungus gnats that are down near the soil that feel like walking around might walk up onto that and uh, get themselves stuck. Once they're stuck there, they can't breed. And fungus gnats do lay an incredible amount of eggs and a lot of them hatch, so they can breed really fast. You see one or two fungus gnats, within a couple weeks they can turn into thousands. They really can if you're in ideal breeding conditions. Here in Nevada where I'm at, it's incredibly dry most of the time, so the only good spots for them to breed are actually in my soil and they can't really, you know, it, it's not ideal for them here, so. They don't thrive, but I, you know, do get them from time to time. So, that's pretty much all I got for you. Like I said, fly strips for the flies. You can actually get the little yellow cards that work a little better, and you can just set them down in your pots. They work much better. Um, gnat mix, sand, diatinaceous earth for the larva, and hydrogen peroxide only on the top layer of the soil for your eggs and it will take care of your fungus gnats if you use all three of those at the same time uh, and i guarantee i've seen like fairly heavy infestations go down to where you're seeing maybe one or two flies in less than a week using all three of those processes at the same time so being that i was to the point i could walk through my garden and see maybe five or ten flies you know what I mean? If I really look down in the soil, maybe find some more. I decided to go through these processes and wipe them out. And just in the last couple days since I've done that, I have I see almost none. Like I did this tent last. I did this tent yesterday and I was still seeing a few of them walking around in here. But this one already has some things stuck to it. This one has some things stuck to it. I'm not seeing any fly around in here. In here I found one or two today. That was it. So pretty sure this problem will be all cleaned up by the time I get back from vacation. So that's all we have on gnats. I hope that helped some of you new growers out that need a little information, a little help on how to get rid of gnats without having to use any pesticides or anything like that because like I said they're a minor problem and they're not they're not such a nuisance that it's worth burning your plants with strong pesticides to get rid of. It's not not you know some pests are you get you get bad mites you get bad root aphids some things like that you need specialty treatments to get rid of some of those things and uh but no nah, fungus gnats they're just a pain so all right what else do we want to talk about I'm going to jamaica in a few days i mentioned that last week uh when i'm away people were asking me how i'm going to have my plants fed more or less, I have a friend of mine that's going to come through and check on things. Also, my flour and my veg. You can see these two bins right here. Sorry. Flour, veg. Um, both are nutrient mix bins on timers that pump twice a day for 15 minutes. And you can see the little drip emitters in there. This 18 gallon reservoir there should last perfectly fine for all four of these for the entire week I'm gone. This one right here though, an 18 gallon res for all these big plants, probably will not. So I gave my homeboy some instructions, in fact I'll show you guys too. Uh, some different things to do in order to take care of it. And I kind of simplified down my GH nutrients. I didn't have them add any uh, like flora blend or any you know anything extra like that just because uh i don't want too many organics in there that might clog up the drip emitters while i'm gone so i kept it strictly to whatever the synthetics were in there kind of balanced it out so that way it should be enough and that level right there is with 15 gallons of water so i'll just have them do that with 15 gallons of water in that and it should be enough to get it through as long as he does that in a few days after it's empty you know it takes about three days to empty four days it takes about four days to empty so 
He does that on day three, day four of my vacation. I'll be all set. And this one. So let's talk about this tent next. Let's do veg last before we get smoking, which I'm almost ready to smoke and I've been rambling. So let's fly through this. See, I got all sorts of work done this week. Man, I've been hustling. So on top of getting ready for my vacation, I've been trying to get this Beyond Dream up and big and up to par, get its environment up to par. You see, I still don't have the light in. It should be in any day, actually. I don't know if it's going to be in before I go to uh, on vacation or not, because I leave Wednesday night. So, And it's Monday night right now. So I'll be in Jamaica by Thursday morning. Yeah. Then Puerto Rico by Sunday. Yeah. All right, enough bragging. You see our Beyond Dreams here is still in veg mode, and this one obviously I plan on scrogging out the entire area here, and this is about a four foot by four foot scrog. I actually cut one inch off, and that's why it fits inside the poles there. But you see it sticks out just a little. I probably should have cut an inch off this way too, made it 311 by 311. It would fit on the inside of this tent a lot better. It's a four by four tent, but Oh well, it's still, uh, I still got it to where I can zip this shut and it stays shut, so I'm going to leave it as is and maybe do those little fine-tuned finicky things next round. But on top of that, I also built myself a flood and drain setup, which is pretty cool. Uh, I got a 400 gallon per hour pump down there, there's a 27 gallon tank. And you see I've had it running for two days now and uh, this was full and it's used maybe an inch, inch and a quarter of nutrients. That's it. So it's, uh, I don't know, maybe two gallons, gallon and a half, it's drank up, which is perfect. That means the whole time I'm gone, this should be able to hold itself. You know, uh, my homeboy shouldn't have to do anything other than check the pH, and uh, I'll just have to refill it when I get home. It should last about a week other than pH checks. So it definitely works out pretty good. It'll fill up to right about there, about two and a half, three inches. So it actually fills up almost to the top of this as it's draining down and gets up to about that level on this drain. But turn it on. See for right now I only have a, my timer only does a half hour at a time. I need to get a timer that does 15 minutes at a time. So and that can actually change the way you want to set up your flood and drain table. So let's turn this on and check it out. So definitely it's pumping away. And uh, you see I also have a small air pump in my flood and drain table and the reason I do that is because I have it on a half hour timer and I only have it flooding twice a day a half hour flood is actually a little too long for your pot and it can be it can kind of flood your roots so that's why I have the air stone in there just to make sure my dissolved oxygen stays as high as possible inside the water that way it doesn't over flood the roots even on a little bit longer flood now there's a lot of people that'll run a flood and drain table and they'll make sure their plants get slightly root bound inside their cups, kind of like how Vader OG does it. And uh, then you flood it like four times a day, five times a day, and you won't even need these air pumps in there. Because what'll happen is every time it gets pumping, once it gets up into these layers and starts going down, not only does it aerate when it starts pumping through there, it'll start shooting back down here as it's circulating and keeping it oxygenated and as long as you got it going really a minimum of four times a day if you're going to do it that way more like five times a day then you really don't even need an air stone in there and it'll keep your water oxygenated enough to keep your nutrients mixed and to uh, get your table running so pretty cool I still prefer to keep an air stone in there the more dissolved oxygen you have the more nutrient uptake availability you're going to be able to have within your plant the easier it's going to your plant's going to be able to have keeping its internal osmotic pressure and you know there's just a lot of benefits to having high dissolved oxygen rates inside your water so that's what i like to do and you see my table definitely working so i'm gonna leave that going until it starts dripping down and we'll go talk about veg Veg, little plants. We were looking at these a minute ago. Let's uh, let's get some close up on some of these buds. I've been rambling at y'all for a minute. You see, this is my autoflower chocolate skunk, and it's on day 81, and it actually started its flush yesterday. So uh, no, 
a couple days ago, like two days ago I started it and uh, flushed it out really well. And you see it is freaking huge. Look at that bud in the back. Like, I am not joking with you guys. This thing's monstrous. Like, you all have seen Leroy before. Let's put Leroy next to that bud. That bud is bigger than Leroy. Freaking huge, man. But, uh, yeah, so that thing definitely came through as a producer. Thanks, Leroy. Appreciate that, buddy. Let you get back to your work there. So this plant really came through as a crazy producer. You've seen on the back side of this where it wasn't getting much light. I actually just rotated it away today. But I've been keeping this side in the light a lot more than the uh, other side of it now. Just to try to let it fill in. And it's definitely been helping. It's been filling in, looking a lot nicer. You see, it's definitely coming through nice and frosty. It has a really ugly foxtail-y structure though, which, uh, you know, happens. I've had that happen with different genetics, especially uh, depending on, oops, sorry about that. Especially depending on, uh, you know, heat and light intensity and genetics pretty much determine how much it's going to foxtail. I find more or less genetics will let it foxtail. Once the genetics tell it it can foxtail, your heat and light really do a lot on how much it's going to foxtail. But then again, so do genetics. But that, like this one for instance, this upper bud right here, believe it or not, you can go all the way down inside there, like two, three inches. And those are all long, like foxtail buds coming out about two, three inches off of the center of that main cola that's actually like three inches wide diameter ridiculous it smells really good too it had uh in like mid flower it had a really really frosty like fuely kind of smell now it's straight up chocolate like i'm not even joking with you guys this thing switched up now it's getting later in its life to like a sweet chocolate like it's delicious. I'm really glad I just stuck my butt, my finger inside of that bud. That sounded gross. But hey, I'm still glad I did it. So let's move it on to all the little ones. Talk about them. Odin. This is my uh, little one from North Genetics. This is our crazy cross. I'll show you real quick. You can pause and look at it if you want. This one is also Odin. You see it's coming through nice and stacked. Uh, actually, tomorrow I'm gonna top both of these so that way they're topped before I go on my vacation. And they're gonna stay there on the dripper and do what they want. They actually just got transplanted yesterday into the number one pots so from their solo cups. So made it through the first transplant. They're looking happy, they're doing their thing. See this one right here, this bushy beast of a plant is our Dream Berries by North Genetics also. This is my uh, Chronic cut that I got from my boy Chris Chronic. And, uh, you know, part of the North Genetics crew. And this is actually the F4 mother to the newest line of Dream Berry seeds. So anyone that wants some souvenir beans and gets a hold of North Genetics, they definitely have a few different uh, crosses and a couple of their own strains available that are pretty awesome. And, uh, you see, you can get a discount and get a hold of them either on email or Instagram. And they have this strain, but the F5 seeds were made from this as the mother plant. So we'll get to see this uh, flower out later, and you'll definitely get to see uh, see what kind of dankness got put into those seeds. So I'm really happy about that. It should be super dank cut of dream berries. So then we come over this way, and this one is my cut of Beyond Dream which is the same as our giant plant in here. And Beyond Dream is fantastic. It's also a North Genetics cut, and it's a Beyond Purple crossed with Dream Berries. And more or less, uh, you go back in its genetics into the grandparents and such, you break it all down. It's a huge pheno hunted mix of Blue Dream, Purple Kush, with a little bit of Flush Berry thrown at the end. And uh, 
this is my keeper fino of it and you see my clones definitely beautiful it came along growing well it got topped the other day and it's coming through with two little tops it's very healthy very happy so you had a couple little calyxes there pre-flowering early it's because it's a clone but they have more of a tendency to do that my dream berries also got topped and you see i got a couple tops coming in there looking great veg is looking good my beyond dream over here is looking good and here's what i'm talking about now see see how that's nicely aerating the uh bin by itself as that pumps see that it's getting now it's at about its max level it gets right up into about there before it really is going down just as fast as it's pumping in but it does not overflow it'll stay right at about this level so pretty cool stuff and that's how I feed my plant twice a day now let's take a dab long video this week well, that's because I gotta go man I'm gonna miss you all this next weekend you're gonna have to let me know what's happening around the tube just in case I don't get too good a Wi-Fi in Jamaica and Puerto Rico all right let's take some dabs dabs ooh delicious okay here we go getting ready for dabs um, see I got my two domes out this is one I usually uh, smoke with you guys see it's nice and clean I just wanted to show you it just has a little bit bigger opening than the other one this is the one I prefer as my daily driver though just when it has that little bit smaller opening it's a little more air restricting and that way even when I don't have it carb capped it seems to work just a hair better than if I have the big one but with you guys I'll put on this one because then uh, depending on the angle you can still see the inside of my nail so I just wanted to show you that getting it dirty you guys get the clean one and let's take a look at some some of this goodness okay uh, if I remember a couple weeks ago I showed you all some hash that I made that came out so so here's some more of it that's some of that exact same grade and I uh, you can see there's a few little black specks some in, in non non plant material impurities in there like that one you can see it gross but other than that it's really an okay oil uh, it's it's level enough that I can burn it and it melts just fine with very little ash but it's still not as clean as I want and I took some of the and this is blue ox by the way so I also took some of the lower grade of the even lower grade the crappy layers of that same run pressed it into some rosin so and that's I've actually pressed out most of it or all of it at this point oops got to be more careful and this is all I have left of it it's still a nice chunk it's probably like a gram or so I haven't weighed it but was to guess and this came out phenomenal quality and clarity focus you pretty stuff so that's what I'm dabbing on and this is uh, from the blue ox bubble hash I'm still working on that it's been like three four weeks about three weeks since I uh, made a batch of bubbles so I think when I get back from vacation vacation the next weekend after that that's probably be one thing uh, I'll get working on so let me get some of this off of here shatter so nice little shatter pieces beautiful rosin huh Ooh, I didn't need all that you know what it's for you guys. I'm gonna take all that. All right, y'all. Let me get my nail heated. I want you guys to get yours heated too. We'll be back to take a ridiculous chunk of rosin to the lungs. Now well, let's do this first. y'all let's 
see, we're going to try to do ourselves a milk shot today. Um, this one's for every one of my subs, you know. There's about 15,400 of y'all. And uh, all, with always, much love, much appreciation. You know, I appreciate every, each and every one of y'all. I got that nice and extra hot, so we can give it a second to cool. Try to get this a little lower temp. And this is for y'all. Oh, this is a glob. Cheers. Oh, that was delicious, y'all. Monster dab or not. All that did was get me high for a good reason. Time the show. All right, y'all. Have a wonderful week. Have a wonderful two weeks. I'll see y'all when we get back, and we'll see some major progress. Definitely follow me on Instagram, and uh, we'll try to get some pictures up. Hopefully from Jamaica, and depending on Wi-Fi, if I can, I'll get some short movies up, too. So, all right, y'all. Much love. Peace from the Duke.